thank you for having me, Sean. And uh, hi, everybody. If you don't know who I am, I'm Leslie Richardson. I'm a program manager on the .NET and C Sharp developer experience team. Most recently, I was doing a lot of work helping to put out the C Sharp dev kit extension for VS Code. So if you like to write C Sharp applications in VS Code and you haven't tried out that extension yet, highly encourage you to do so and share your feedback. Tell me what you liked or what you hated, and I will make sure that the team gets it so that we can make that experience better productivity-wise. Uh, other than that, I'm also working in the Razor tooling space for that area as well for both VS and VS Code. But before that, I was uh, working on the Visual Studio team and specifically the first team that I joined when I came to Microsoft was debugging, which is uh, where this talk kind of comes from today. So I'm really excited to share with you some cool tips and tricks for making your life a little bit less frustrating when it comes to debugging. Because let's be honest, I think we've all been stressed out having to spend hours debugging something. We just want to get back to writing code. It can be really tedious stopping and starting and trying to figure out what's going on with your code. And luckily, there are a lot of different tools and options that Visual Studio has to make a lot of those experiences easier that go beyond the basic breakpoints and stepping mechanics and print statements if you're like me <laughs> and like your print statements. So uh, that that is the goal. I hope that each of you can take away at least one new feature that you can incorporate into your debugging environment. And also on the Tulsa side, I do want to say I that is not completely foreign to me. I um, My dad was in the military when I was a kid and I lived in Edmond, Oklahoma for a little bit. Um, at Tinker Air Force Base. So yeah, familiar with Tulsa, been there for a couple of radios, I remember. So yeah, nice to kind of like a mini reunion, reunion of, a, of a sort. So, all right, before we dive into this mostly demo heavy session, I have a couple housekeeping things. So I'm gonna be using the latest version of Visual Studio 2022. 99.9% uh, .9 of the debugging tools that I'm going to be talking about are available in Visual Studio community. Uh, that remaining 0.1%, I will do my best to uh, be explicit as to what that is um, when we get to it, but everything else, you're golden. I'm going to be sharing a mix of both old and new debugging tools, including some that are Visual Studio 2022 exclusive. So if you haven't updated to VS 2022, hopefully this talk um, might push you in, the, in that direction. And finally, all of the tools that I will be sharing are uh, C Sharp and C++ compatible. They might be compatible for other .NET languages, but I haven't tested that out, so use them at your own risk. And uh, content-wise, I've got about maybe 40 to 45 minutes, probably closer to 45 minutes worth of content, as well as some allotted time for q and I wasn't quite sure how much of the rest of the meetup I could stay for. So I wanted to make sure that there's enough time for Q&A. That said, just because it's not a 60 minute talk doesn't mean there's not a lot of content. I counted at one point how many tools and tips I was sharing and it was close to 30 <laughs> at the very least. So um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we're gonna cover and I'm excited to share it. So let's hop on in to Visual Studio. And okay, get rid of the screen share. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, so before I jump into the main application that I'm going to be using um, as an example, uh, you're welcome to ask any questions along the way in the chat. I guess Sean might ask is that I don't, I'm currently just on my laptop. So um, if you see any questions in the chat, can you let me know about them? Otherwise, I have. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Sweet. Other than that, I do have like stopping points throughout this talk um, for people to ask questions if you want as well. So, um, but yeah, before we get into the main application that I'm going to be using to demonstrate some cool tools, I do want to give a shout out to the attach to process window, which you may already be familiar with if you've ever had to attach to and debug um, remote processes or uh, processes that are stored in like a Docker container or something like that. But this is a window, if you haven't seen it before, that lets you attach to any running process. You can also attach locally if you need to do that too. And I wanted to point it out, especially because there have been a lot of really nice quality of life updates to this attaching experience, just <laughs> so that getting started with debugging doesn't have to be a hassle. So little things such as the ability to automatically locate any connection targets that you have, whether that's um, remote or otherwise. Um, I don't have any remote connections right now, but if, if I did, then it would auto detect them for me, which is nice. 
Additionally, little things like the ability to have automatic, automatic refresh. This window used to not be able to do that. You had to manually do it yourself, which that time can add up with the amount of time that you might be spamming the refresh button otherwise. The ability to see all of your processes in a tree view by uh, default, that was not the case before. This used to be non-existent and it would look more like this. So having to go through an alphabetical order, which processes is which can be kind of hard, especially if you don't quite know the relationship between the different processes and which one's a child or not. Similarly, if you've got processes that are the that have like the same name, uh, we've added a new column, like the command line, which would help you probably uh, be able to differentiate between which process you actually care about a little bit better. And my personal favorite, if you're more of a visual person and maybe you don't know the name of the process, but you've got it up and running, then you can do select process. And it's kind of similar to if you're taking a screenshot of just a window, you can do the same thing. So if I wanted to attach to PowerPoint for whatever reason, then Visual Studio will recognize that when I select that window and it will take me to that process. So lots of nice new updates to this window that make it easier just to get started when it comes to attaching to the right process that you want to debug. So with that, um, my application that I'm gonna be using is on my local machine, so I don't need to attach, but just wanna make sure you knew about that one. So to kick things off, uh, to give a little context, this is a, an ASP.NET Core app. Um, I like to read a lot, so I wrote an app that basically randomly gives me a list of books that I can choose to read and they will be added to my virtual shelf, or I can choose to reject them and they won't be added. But unfortunately, this app has several bugs and several things that I want to inspect. So we're going to use some Visual Studio debugging tools to figure them out. So the first thing that I want to do is check out this book manager constructor that I have here. This is a constructor that runs right at the app startup. And it's just taking in a JSON list of book information and stores each of those books into a book object, which then gets stored into a book list. Um, so I'm going to set a breakpoint at the start of my book manager, but as much as I could just use a regular breakpoint, I don't want to do that because ultimately I only want to check out this constructor one time and be done with it. And I don't want to have to remember to delete that breakpoint afterward and then go through the, <laughs> the trouble of, whoops, I forgot to delete it. I run my app and then that breakpoint still gets hit and then having to go back to the window and remember to delete it at that point. So New to Visual Studio 2022 is a brand new breakpoint called a temporary breakpoint, which I can access by right clicking in the gutter and selecting insert temporary breakpoint. And it's a little hard to see probably, but there's a clock icon inside that breakpoint there. So that means that this breakpoint is going to be a one and done breakpoint, meaning that it will disappear after it's been hit once. All right, so we hit the breakpoint. As you can see, it is no more, thus saving me the trouble of having to remember to delete it when I'm done with it. But I actually lied a little bit because while I'm at the top of my constructor, I do want, I actually want to go to the bottom of my method so that I can check out this books list and see that it's been populated correctly. So there are a couple ways that I can navigate down to the bottom. Of course, I can uh, just step through, spam F10 until I get down there. But that's going to be frustrating, especially once I hit this for loop, which has around 100 iterations that it's going to go through, and that's not very productive. So uh, another option that I can use is a feature called Run to Click, which is a tool I use a lot. And to use that, I can hover over the line I want to run my code's execution up to, and then select the little green glyph icon that appears. And then Visual Studio will run my code's execution up to that point. So it's like having a, a remote control and being able to fast forward to the line that you want to go to. However, I am still going to run into this for loop issue because I've got a breakpoint that's hitting, uh, that's hanging out around here. And maybe I don't want to delete it for whatever reason either. So if I were to try to use run to click to get past this for loop, it's still going to hit that breakpoint. It's going to hit it around 100 times. <laughs> so. That doesn't alleviate the issue all the way. But fortunately, in Visual Studio 2022, we have kind of an upgrade to run to click called force run to click, which lets you bypass any breakpoints that you've got along the path of execution that you want to go to. So to use that, I can pretend as if I'm doing a regular run to click. And I can hold the shift key 
So I get two little green glyph icons. And I am now able to pass that breakpoint without having to delete it or do anything else with it or disable it or whatever. So really nice time saver to quickly speed through your code and get to where you need to go. All right, so at this point, I have made it to my books list and I wanna take a look at it. So I'm gonna go ahead and pin this data tip, which fun fact about data tips, if you choose to pin it like I did, that data tip will persist even outside this debugging session. So you can stop debugging and then um, start a new session and that will still be there until you manually decide to get rid of it. So when I check out my books, uh, this isn't really the greatest way to inspect them. If I wanted to identify each book by like their title or their author or something like that, I'd have to expand each of these out and make to make sure that I've got the right books that are populated. And that's not really productive. I already know the type of object that's being stored in this list, so this information isn't useful. Same with if I were doing the same in the locals, autos, or watch windows. So there are a couple ways that we can improve this experience or customize what gets displayed in your debugging environment. So the first, which a lot of you might already be familiar with, is the ability to override your class's two-string method. So this will allow you to see or to customize what properties or string values are getting displayed in your debugging context, but it has the con of whatever shows up in your debugging context will also show up potentially um, in your user-facing app experience if you end up calling that two-string method somewhere else in your code, which you may not want. And on top of that, you have to modify your code to use it, and you have to start a new debugging session in order to see all of that kick into action, which we're trying to avoid stopping and starting as much as possible. That already takes up so much time when it comes to debugging as it is. So the less you have to do that, the better. So option number two to get rid of some of those issues is an attribute called debugger display. I'm not gonna demo it here, but um, this is the syntax for it. You stick it at the, at the top of your class, but this is an attribute that again, lets you customize what gets displayed in your debugger environment and only your debugger environment. So whatever happens in the debugger display stays in the debugger display. However, again, you still have to modify your code to use it and you still have to start a new debugging session. So in order to get past those modification issues and having to stop and start, we added a newer feature, which is like maybe my favorite <laughs> debugging tool of all time because I use it all of the time, is a tool called Pinnable Properties. So to use it, I can go either into my data tip or a locals window and expand out an object. And you'll notice that when I hover over any of these properties, there's a little pin icon that shows up. So I can choose to pin title if I want to view all of the books by its title. And let's also do author in the process. And you'll notice that both of those pinned properties get bubbled up to the top of the property list. And the magic here is that now you can see right away a great um, display of those properties and only those properties. So it's a really nice way to customize what you care about the most as, um, in relation to object properties. There are some additional features that come with this, including the ability to um, remove the names of the properties. And also, if you have maybe have a large list of properties, but you only care about a select few of them, then you can pin those and then filter out anything you didn't pin. So if I just cared about title and author, then I can do just that. So pretty cool. I use it a lot. Again, this also shows up in data tips at the same time. And you'll notice that I did not have to modify my code and I did not have to stop and start the debugger session in order to make that happen. All right, so now that I've got the view that I want to see, I also wanna check out this JSON string value up top. However, because I've reached the end of my method, that variable is currently out of scope. But again, we're trying to avoid uh, having to stop and start as much as possible. So there is a way for me to hop back and quickly reinspect that variable. So I can use a feature called set to next statement, which is as simple as dragging and dropping the execution pointer to whatever line of code I want to have run next. So I could drag and drop, but I personally like to go the, um, the run to click action method. 
So uh, as if I were going to do a run to click, I can hold the control key this time instead of shift and I get a little yellow arrow and that will automatically move the arrow for me. You can also access that one via the context menu, but it's a little hard to find. There it is. So um, that is an option as well as well as the keyboard shortcut. And uh, so this is a really nice tool for being able to quickly going back and reinspecting uh, variables. It's also good if maybe you have a block of code that you know is really buggy or you just don't want it to run as you're debugging. So you just want to skip over it. Great for those sorts of things. But you have to use this tool at your own risk because this is not the same as a step back or the same as um, a rewind feature. Everything that's already run in your code has still already run. You're basically just telling Visual Studio what line of code do you want to have run next. So depending on where you place that execution pointer arrow, it could mess up your code's execution, which might result in you having to start up a new debugging session. So beware. <laughs> but in this context, it should be okay. So taking a look at our JSON string, this is obviously not the most readable experience. All the formatting that I expect to see with a JSON formatted string is gone. And I'm not going to have a fun time reading all of this <laughs> if I chose to just view it in this manner. So if you're either in a, either in a data tip or if you're in your locals window, you can check out this magnifying glass icon next to strings like this. And this gives you a, a default list of text visualizers that you can use to make this experience better. So by default, if I were to check out the text visualizer, this is a much nicer experience, which I think is great. Also really good if you just have a large block of text for whatever reason, you just wanna see it in a wider surface area. But of course, since we're looking at a JSON formatted string, we can also use the JSON visualizer. And this one's even better. It's treating it like an array of objects because that's what it is. And I can filter out, uh, out things with keywords. So if I wanted to, again, identify books by title, then I can do that. So really, again, a nice way to customize your inspection experience when you're um, analyzing variables as you're debugging. What's cool about these visualizers is that if you want, you can also create your own. I'm not going to go into it here, but I do have resources that I'm going to share at the end of this talk. And one of those resources has a link in it that will tell you how you can do that if you're interested in that. And in addition to those text visualizers, a customer ask that had existed for a while um, was the ability to have a visualizer, but for a list of items. And I am so excited because that is finally here as of 2022. So introducing the I enumerable visualizer or the table visualizer for short. So using my books list as an example, I can use its magnifying glass, which will appear over any I enumerable that you have. And it will give you a tabular representation of that list, which can be really nice if you're more of a table person like I am versus maybe a tree view person. And it kind of looks like you're in a mini version of Excel <laughs> to the point where if you wanted to, you can actually export your data to CSV or an Excel file if you wanted to um, analyze or manipulate it further. So yeah, that was a lot of ground and we're, we haven't even gotten to the app proper yet. <laughs> so to recap real quick, we talked about a couple different ways to navigate through your code, such as run to click, which is like fast forwarding to the line of code uh, that you want to execute up to. We talked about force run to click, which lets you bypass any breakpoints that happen along the way. We talked about set to next statement, which lets you drop your execution pointer anywhere you want in order to reinspect values or skip over whole blocks of code. And we talked about different ways you can customize your debugging environment, such as text visualizers and the table visualizer and my personal favorite pinnable properties. And of course, temporary breakpoints. Now you see it. Now you don't after it gets hit once. So before we move on, does anyone have any questions? I don't see any in the chat at the moment, but this is awesome. I'm, I'm so excited about these uh, this new, uh, new enhancements that they've added, like the I enumerable viewer. That is awesome. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm really excited about that one too. That one was, I, I was pushing for that one. Like around the time I changed teams from the debugger, it was, in my to-do list. It's like, we have to do this. It would be so cool. So I'm, I was really excited when it happened. All right. 
So moving on, if no one has any questions, uh, truth be told, I lied about this break point, so I'm going to get rid of that one. And we're going to go ahead and hit continue. So uh, just to recap as to what this app does, this is like <laughs> kind of like Tinder for books. So I'm given a random book that I can either choose to read or sw swipe right on and add to my shelf or swipe left and reject it and it won't be added to my shelf. However, one of the first bugs that I noticed with this has to do with me being overzealous and choosing uh, to read every single book that could potentially be uh, recommended to me and adding them all to my shelf. So when I do that, unfortunately, I still get an empty shelf. I expect to see a list of wonderful book covers populating this home screen and it, that's not there. So let's go into Visual Studio and see if we can figure this out. So this issue is probably having something to do with my add all to shelf method. And this is the method that's responsible for taking all of, the, all of those books and storing them on my shelf. So ideally, I would like to take a look at this for loop that I've got here. And specifically, I want to, I really only care about the last iteration of this for loop. So while I could set a regular breakpoint here, I would be spamming F5 or step over for forever until I reach ideally I equals 99 or however many books I've got that can be moved to my shelf. So again, not a great use of my time. So instead we can use another kind of breakpoint called a conditional breakpoint, which lets me uh, specify under what circumstance or condition I want that breakpoint to be hit at. So again, I. Uh, I'll do the opposite way, I, or you can access it via the, well, you can access it via the quick menu if you want, but of course you can also do this where you just set a regular breakpoint and then hover over it and select settings. And we're going to go into conditions. And so in my case, I want this breakpoint to hit when I is equal to neutral books dot count minus one. I like this too because um, it gives you IntelliSense in there as well, which is nice. You can also add additional conditions <laughs> if uh, you really want something very advanced. So that is an option as well, but I'm just gonna stick with the one. And you'll notice now it's conditional. It's got a little plus sign inside. So we're good to go there. Additionally, I like my print statement. So I would also like to be able to print out the number of books that are being shelved. However, I'm trying to avoid print statements today. It requires me to um, modify my code and then potentially start up a new debugging session if I'm still working on debugging. So as an alternative to that, if you like print statements, but you don't want to have to go through those cons, you can use a trace point, which is another kind of breakpoint. So accessing that quick menu again, we're going to insert a trace point toward the end of my method. And I'm now being prompted to show a message in the output window. So let's say number of books, colon, and then uh, braces or curly braces to indicate a value. Um, let's do shelved books dot count. And you have the option to uh, do by default continue code execution. So this breakpoint won't be hit, but it will still trigger. And that will result in the output window getting this new print statement. Otherwise, you can treat it like a regular breakpoint if you want. And then uh, Visual Studio will pause at that point if you wanted to. We're going to keep it as is. So I've got my conditional breakpoint and I've got my trace point. But at the end of the day, I really only care about this trace point if this for loop is actually being entered. So in order to alleviate some potential performance hiccups, which full transparency, uh, Conditional breakpoints and trace points can definitely eat up some uh, <laughs> some performance. It might take a little longer for those breakpoints to hit. So to alleviate some of that, I really only care about this trace point when this conditional breakpoint is hit, aka this for loop is being entered. So new to Visual, 20, Visual Studio 2022 is a kind of breakpoint called a dependent breakpoint, which lets you enable a breakpoint only when another breakpoint is hit. So it's dependent, one is dependent on the other. So with this trace point, I'm going to select only enable when the following breakpoint is hit. And I'm going to select the breakpoint above it. And now you'll notice that this trace point, it's hollowed out as if it's disabled because it is. And it's also so got a little diagonal 
arrow icon to indicate that it's depending on another one. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and refresh my session and see what happens and see if we can figure out what's going on. So I'm refreshing here, but the beauty about trace points and conditional breakpoints a lot of the time is that depending on what you're doing, you don't have to do that all the time. In my case, I kind of did have to refresh, otherwise things are going to get messed up. But the beauty about trace points versus regular print statements is that you don't always have to do that. So going to perform that same behavior, I'm going to add all of those books to my shelf again. And I'm not, a, I'm not getting a notification from Visual Studio that anything has been hit. So that's probably telling me that there's something up with this for loop that's causing it not to be entered. And as you can see, the trace point is still uh, disabled because that conditional breakpoint hasn't been hit yet. So looking at it, turns out I just made the wonderful typo of setting my I index value equal to <laughs> the number, equal to the conditional value or the conditional statement limit here. So I'm just going to set it equal to zero and that should fix the problem. So we're going to run it again and see if these breakpoints are going to kick into gear. All right, so same behavior, adding all the books to my shelf. It's taking a little longer, which might be a good sign. There we go. So as you can see, the conditional breakpoint has been hit, which in turn enabled this trace point down here. So once I continue my code, that trace point should actually print something else to the output window. So it looks like my for loop is good to go. You know that it's conditional because instead of I starting at zero, it started at I equal 99. So the conditional breakpoint did what it was supposed to do. And if we hit continue, then we should be able to see both the ses successful result of what I was expecting on my homepage. I've got a list of a bunch of public domain books all at my disposal. And also we can go into the output window and try to find that message. And, oh, well, there it is. So as you can see, <laughs> it's kind of hard to find that message in the output window, unfortunately. There's already a lot going on in the output window. So the added perk of using a trace point over a regular print statement is that you can go ahead and use the diagnostics tools window, aka that window that you probably have found yourself closing. I've been there myself because you're wondering, what the heck is the point of this thing? Like, why? <laughs> Just takes up space. Well, don't sleep on this window because it's got one of my favorite pieces, uh, one of my favorite windows within it uh, called the events window. So let's move this up a little bit. So the events tab basically logs all of the major moments that happen as your code is running. So things such as program output, um, breakpoints being hit, exceptions that might be encountered, that sort of thing. And that, of course, includes trace points, which is a kind of breakpoint. So we can actually check out the trace point. But this is still kind of hard to find. However, unlike output window, we can actually filter out things we don't care about. So I'm going to filter out everything but that trace point. And there it is. There's my message. So this can be a really nice, easier way to review any print statements that you've got if you're using trace points to do that with. And as an added bonus, if you wanted to go back in time to the moment where that trace point was actually triggered, then you can do that with by activating historical debugging. So we're in the past. Ooh. Um, and this is this is pretty cool. You can check out uh, what the status of different variables were at that given point in time, if you want. So this is the 0.1% item that I think is still exclusive to enterprise. It may not be. Um, if you wanted to try it out and you're using community or pro, let me know. <laughs> but last time I checked, it was still enterprise exclusive. And that's because the way this works is that um, as your code is running, Visual Studio is taking a snapshot of the state of your application 
which also specifically occurs when that trace point is triggered. So that snapshot basically gets saved for you. And then by hitting historical debugging, Visual Studio will load up that snap, that snapshot for you. So pretty cool. You can go back in we time. Got, uh, we got a couple of questions right quick. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so if we're going to go back in time just a little bit, um, no pun intended. The, <laughs> so first question is, um, are these features, the new ones that you're talking about, are they specific to the Visual Studio Windows or the Mac Edition has them? Ah, good question. Um, most of these are exclusive to the Windows version. I'm not totally sure on uh, which ones are compatible with Mac, but um, I know a lot of them are not available in Mac, at least a lot of the new ones. Okay. All right. And the other question was, what was that keystroke to create a trace point? Yeah. Um, let's, first of all, let's get out of main debugging. Yeah. So to create a trace point, you can do it a couple of ways. You can either set a, re a regular breakpoint and then hover over and select settings and then go to actions. I know that's kind of a weird word. I've been <laughs> telling the debugging team we should change that word to something else because it's a little confusing. But um, once you select actions, you'll be prompted to write a message that gets displayed in the output window. So that's how you can create it. You can also do it a little quicker or be directed to actions a little quicker by right clicking in that breakpoint gutter and selecting insert trace point. And that's how you do it. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and. Is there by chance, is that the control shift F10 or is that for a different? Uh, or like, is that the shortcut for trace point creation? Yeah, or, yeah, or am I, or did I have that mixed up? It was on the edit window. Um, oh, um, I want to say it's not. I feel like that's for set to next statement, actually. Oh, that, that's right. You're at set next statement. Yep. Yeah, set okay. next, yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Yep, no so, uh, but let me, let me point out something right quick, because I don't know if people get the significance of this. There are third party or you know, third party products out there that are for kind of a, a caching of the history of state so that you can debug in the past. Now, you guys have incorporated that into Visual Studio, and that is phenomenal. I'm glad it's there to go back in a previous time to see a, a, a a state as it was in a previous time. That is a that is a big feature. Awesome. So yeah, that was awesome. cool. Yeah, I'm glad y'all are enjoying it. Um, yeah, that was that feature was pretty new around the time I joined the team, and I was like, whoa, that's kind of trippy. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so yeah, lots of cool stuff in here. Um, all right. So if no one else has any other questions, I'm gonna keep on going. Sweet. So I've got more problems going on with this application that we're going to address. So let's check out another one. So this next one has to do with once I finish a book. So let's say I choose to read this book called Blindness. I've never actually heard of that one, but it won a Nobel, Nobel Prize. So I guess it must be pretty good. But unfortunately, um, so for context, I love to reread books um, <laughs> that I enjoy. Like I've probably read Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss at least three times. I want to read it again. Uh, <laughs> though I would like to know the number of times that I finished the book. However, it's already telling me that I've read this particular book once, and then it's giving me a date that no longer exists, which is a bit of a red flag. So if I say that I finished this book and go back to it, now it says that I've read this book four times, and I am not that fast of a reader. <laughs> so there's probably something going on and something being changed in Visual Studio or in my program that I'm not aware of. So let's see if we can't figure this out. So because I don't really know where I want to start right away, I'm going to put a breakpoint in my index method here. And I'm just going to use a temporary breakpoint again because I only intend to use it once. Oh, wrong one. That is a trace point. Here we go. And that should just hit once I go back to my shelf. There we go. So my theory is that I have a variable called times red, which exists in my book class. And it's probably being modified or incremented in a spot that I am unaware of and I didn't intend to have incremented at. 
So this might be the point where I'd have to just do some educated guesses on and trial and error in terms of trying to narrow down where that issue could be occurring from. But there is another breakpoint that I can use that would allow me to track a particular property and be notified about when that property changes. So that is called a data breakpoint. So to access that, I'm gonna go into locals window and I could just expand this out and find that property, but I'm gonna use the search tool up above, which will save me some time because I don't remember where that property is. And to set a data breakpoint, I can right click that property and select uh, break when value changes. So you'll notice you get a little breakpoint icon next to that property now. And because you obviously can't see that breakpoint in one of your files, you can see it in the breakpoint window. So there it is right there. It's got the dollar sign one indicating the temporary object ID that got created for it so that Visual Studio can keep track of this property even if it goes out of scope while my, um, while my code is running. So before, while we're here, I do wanna give a little aside and shout out to the breakpoints window because it is a great hub for being able to manage all of your breakpoints that you have. So if you're somebody who likes to have breakpoints all over the place, let me drop a couple just to demonstrate. Then this is the window for you. So what's great about this is that in addition to just obviously being able to see all of your breakpoints at once, you can double click a breakpoint and it will automatically take you to that breakpoint in the editor. You can also label breakpoints. So you can right click, go to edit labels and I don't know, let's call this home controller BP. Okay, and then you can apply any labels that you create to other breakpoints if that's what you wanna do. And you can also filter this way. So once you have some labels or specific keywords, you can type in home controller and then choose to disable all the breakpoints matching that particular criteria, which is pretty nice. You also have a bunch of different columns that you can use to identify breakpoints, such as the ability to see how many times a particular breakpoint has been hit, as well as others such as language. Um, so <laughs> depending on what language you have associated with a given breakpoint, so if you've got one in JavaScript land, you got another one in C Sharp, it'll tell you that, and all these other things. However, the newest feature that's been added fresh off the presses as of like, I want to say one or two months ago, <laughs> we have finally added breakpoint groups. So now you can create uh, full-blown groups for your breakpoints to further organize them. So let's say I've got home controller BPs. So I've got that group and then I can move whatever breakpoints I want into that group. And this is this makes it even faster to be able to disable them all at once. Let me go to the home controller like this. Yay. Saving you a lot of time. You can delete them all at once if that's what you want to do. And as an added bonus, earlier we talked about dependent breakpoints. And with breakpoint groups, you can actually enable an entire group of breakpoints when a a uh, specified breakpoint is hit. So you can use dependent breakpoints with full groups or full sets of breakpoints if that floats your boat. So I found that really exciting. I remember seeing the blog post for that. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I've wanted this for so long. So I was excited to see this one personally. So if you like to have a lot of breakpoints around, maybe you don't want to have a bunch of temporary breakpoints and you want to keep them around for a while, but you want to be able to easily manage them and view them and disable them when needed, this is the window for you. So definitely check this out. Well, let me interject right quick. Uh, one of the other benefits of this is that you can export and import breakpoints. And so all of those conditions that you've set up and just precisely how you want to do it, if you want to hand it off to a coworker, and let them check that out and hit the kind of experience the same debugging session and issue that you're experiencing, you can set that up for them and uh, work that way. Um, and I also have another question as soon as you're available to handle regarding um, a going back uh, to see previous state of a variable. Mm -hmm. So if we could do it that right now or we can do it here in a bit. It's up to you. Okay. Um, sure, we can do it now. Okay. So the question then is, can you show us the new... VS Studio, uh, Visual Studio window um, that shows all the values a variable has taken 
I think the name of this uh, new window is the value tracker or something like that. You know, I don't think I'm actually familiar with that one. The value tracker. That's cool. Um, hmm. I'd have to look into that one. I'm actually not familiar with that, but if that's real, that's really cool. And I'm sad I didn't know about that because otherwise I totally would have added that to this talk. Um, yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll, ch we'll check into that and then come back to this. And uh, Cool. Um, all, right. all right. All right, then I'll keep on going. So uh, I'm going to get rid of these breakpoints I don't need. I just need that data breakpoint. So since we had an aside, just to recap, this data breakpoint is going to track what is going on with this particular property as I'm running my uh, running my code. So let's try to do some stuff with this app and see if we can't get that breakpoint to trigger. And that took a lot less time than expected. So as you can see, the data breakpoint's been hit. You get a little nice notification window telling you that it's been hit. You'll be redirected to the location where that change occurred exactly. And you'll also be told what the previous value of that property was, as well as what its new value is. So in my case, my property is being changed in its setter, which that was kind of a given. So I'm more interested in what recently called that setter. So I can go into the call stack window to retrace my steps and figure out what happened. So I'm going to go one frame below this one. And I am taken to this line of code, which seems very odd and seems like a fun typo I made where basically I have times read being incremented just by selecting the book from my shelf and not by hitting the finish button. So I don't need that. So we're going to comment that out. And we're going to refresh and hopefully the issue is solved. So data breakpoints, I think they can be really useful. Uh, like in this situation, if you don't want to play the trial and error game and you want to be able to keep track of when a property is changing, it's also good maybe if you joined a new team or you inherited a new code base, you're unfamiliar with it, there's a bug going on and there's hundreds of files and you don't even know where to start with this uh, variable that's being accessed in multiple places. So that's when a data breakpoint might be able to come in clutch. So performing that same action, let's add a book to my shelf. We're going to check it out. And this is a good sign. It said I've read it zero times. So when I finish this book and go back to it, it should only say one time. And that is exactly what I get. So data breakpoints, really useful. You can get rid of some of that trial and error as well as to recap some of the other stuff, the search tool and the auto locals and watch. Um, definitely check those out. Definitely check that out. Save you some time if you've got a lot going on in those windows and you just want to quickly narrow things down. Uh, the breakpoint window, really great for managing your breakpoints. And yeah, check all of that out. So good stopping point real quick. Just check in for any more questions. Uh, nope, not at the moment. All right, cool. So I've got one more issue that I'd like to check out in this application. And then I've got like a lightning round of some other debugging features that I want to make sure that I share. So the last issue that I have has to do with the string at the bottom here. So I have a tendency to read multiple books at once. And there have been times where I have finished multiple books within the same day. So in, in addition to getting the date that I finished the book, I'd also like to get the exact time that I clicked the I finished this book button. So let's go into Visual Studio and see if we can um, inspect and hopefully identify where I can make that change at. So going into home controller, I'm going to set a breakpoint and I'm going to use a temporary breakpoint because I only need it once. Over in this line of code, which is responsible for returning that string. So I'm just going to refresh this page. All right, so I'm at this line of code, and honestly, there's a lot going on here. I've got this view bag dot time finished. I've got some nested function calls. It's kind of a lot. So ideally, I want to break this line of code down in order to better understand it and also understand where I can make my time addition. So dealing with this nested uh, with these nested function calls, I can just use step into if I wanted to. However, I don't have full confidence 
and knowing where that step into is going to go to first. And honestly, I just want to be able to have full control over which method gets stepped into first as I'm debugging. So to do that, there's kind of a upgrade to step into, but this one's existed for a long time. And it's called step into specific. So you can access the context menu on the line of code you're interested in, and then select step into specific. And you'll get a nice drop down of a bunch of framework methods, as well as your own methods that you can choose to step into. So it's it works exactly like step into, except you have a choice. So I'm going to go to person string, And it stepped into that. This one's very basic. It's just returning my name. So let's step through and get out of here. And now I want to go check out the finish to string method. And I'm going to use step into specific again. And now we're at finish to string. And I've got this return value here that's got some string concatenation. And ultimately, I'd like to be able to better understand what is being returned here. And usually, this might be the point where I'd stop debugging and then create an arbitrary variable that I don't really need just to be able to see what value is getting returned by this method. However, fun fact, if you go to your locals or your autos windows and you um, step over your return value, you'll notice by default, you get a return keyword that appears that lets you see your uh, the value that is being returned from your method without having to do any of those extra variable steps if you don't need it. So that's really nice. This also is the same in the autos window. And if you want to access in the what? access it in the watch window. Oh, you kind of already saw it, but I'll show you how you get to that point. Um, there is a way to see the return value. So you can enter the dollar sign symbol. And from there, you'll get a nice drop down of a bunch of different um, options that you have in terms of what you can view in the watch window. These options do vary depending on the language that you're working with. So I encourage you to experiment. This drop down was new as of 2019 specifically. So I'm really glad that this is here because it tells you what each of these will give you, including return value, which displays the return value of a .NET method. So there you go. You can access your return value that way. In addition to that, you can also access format specifiers to further customize what's getting displayed in your watch window by using the comma. And you'll get a similar dropdown with a bunch of other different options. So for instance, if maybe you're looking at an int value that's in decimal and you want to view it in hex, then you can use comma H or comma D for vice versa. If I wanted to remove the quotation marks around the string that I'm looking at, then I can use comma and Q and it will remove the quotation marks. So there's a lot of fun options that you can explore and play around with. Again, I think those also change depending on the language that you're working with. Um, so definitely worth experimenting. And yeah, it's really cool. The drop downs were a lifesaver, though. <laughs> I think I was the actually the person who suggested that one because I was learning up on the debugger when I joined the team and had no idea those existed, nor would I have any clue how anyone would know those existed unless <laughs> unless they were aware of the exact uh, format specifiers that they could access. So pretty cool. All right, so we I think we're almost there. So now I would like to navigate into this finished book string method, but I've technically reached the end of this method. However, instead of starting up a new session, I can use set to next statement again. So I'm gonna move the pointer back here and then I'm gonna step into specific and go to finish book string. And here we are. And once again, using return value, I want to go see the value of this. So step over. And there is that final string. And taking a look at this, it looks like I have a two short date string call, which is probably what is truncating the exact time. So let's go ahead and delete that. And that should solve things. It might let me hit continue. Let's see. Yeah, it did. I didn't continue to the rescue. <laughs> and from there, uh, I can refresh. And as you can see, the time has been added successfully. So. In short, we talked about step into specific. This is a tool that usually when I tell people about it, that that is a lot of people's favorites. So I hope it's one of your favorites too. Um, it's just a nice way to get 
full control over what you're stepping into. Really great if you've got nested functions or daisy chained functions or anything like that. And you also have access to different format specifiers. If you're using the watch window, there's the return value keyword specifically for watch, or you can just use the default returned keyword in um, the locals and the autos windows as well. So pretty neat. And before I go into the lightning round, are there any more questions? Then after that, it's basically a free for all <laughs> open season on questions. So, uh, yeah, a, a question just came in. It says, "What is the meaning of the squeakles in the uh, Solution Explorer?" Uh oh, the squeakle? Oh, like the squigglies? Yeah, the squiggles. Oh, yeah, yeah squiggly mm -hmm. lines. So this is actually um, an extension that I have installed. I don't remember the exact name. Let's see if I can pull it up, if I can hide away screen sharing right now. <laughs> uh, how do I, how do I best get rid of the, oh gosh. Because you're in Zoom. Yeah, <laughs> it's up there. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try to like, let's do this. Yeah, I know it's definitely a Matt Christensen extension. I have like his whole productivity tool suite, but it's basically an extension that will give you squigglies for files in the solution explorer if there are actually errors within that particular file or in that solution or project. So it's like a quick way to identify what files are giving Visual Studio grief, which I like. Oh, oh it would help if I stopped debugging. Under extensions? Yep. Oh, <laughs> it was covered up by the screen share. I was like, where? All right. Let's see if I can remember which one it is. That would be, oh, yeah, Solution Error Visualizer 2022. So, yeah, highlights errors and warnings in the Solution Explorer and also allows the solution explorer to be filtered by error type. So um, green squiggly, squigglies indicate warnings in this case. Um, if I had any actual errors, then they would be red ones. But I highly recommend you check that out. That's part of a larger productivity pack, I wanna say. I will, I can like drop that in the chat <laughs> somewhere after we're um, done with this talk in case you're interested, because I think there's a lot of cool, nice quality of life features within that set of extensions that are worth your time. So yeah. Any other questions there? Uh, nope, not at the moment, but uh, I do highly recommend pr pretty much any extension by Maz. Matt Maz, Maz uh, <laughs> Christensen, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, when in doubt, just get a Mads K extension. They're, they're usually great. Yeah. All right, so I've got a little lightning round just to wrap things up with a couple other remaining um, tools that I didn't get to in the demo itself, but I still want to mention. So first up is asynchronous debugging. It can be a real pain in the butt. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, you're not necessarily dealing with linear execution. And on top of that, Visual Studio likes to hide a lot of critical information that might be useful to you when you're debugging by default. So fortunately, there are a few tools that you can take advantage of to make debugging async uh, easier. So the first is the task window, which gives you a tabular representation of all of your tasks that are uh, and that are currently in context. So it will tell you what their status are, uh, their statuses are, whether they're blocked, active, or waiting. It will tell you the um, the time that the thread kicked off of at the start of the application. It will tell you how long the task has been running for. It will tell you where that task is currently located um, method-wise, and also tell you uh, where that particular task originated from. A lot of people like to use that window alongside the parallel stacks window, which gives you a visual graphical representation of your tasks and their trajectory. This is really nice, especially because we've updated this window a lot in recent versions. So if you try to use it in the past and had issues with it and you haven't used it in a minute, highly encourage you to try it out again and see if it's any better because we've We've made it definitely a lot more reliable. It used to be pretty inconsistent in terms of the information it would give you, but now it's um, 
it's improved a lot. So it gives you also the statuses of the tasks. It tells you where they're going at a given point in time. You get a corresponding call stack for each task that tells you where each task has been traveling to. And if you are somebody who has both a multi-threaded and an, uh, a multitasking application, you can use, we're currently looking at the tasks view, but there's also a threads view as well. So you can toggle back and forth between the tasks view and the threads view of the parallel stacks window to better understand the relationship between your tasks and your threads. And you can even like right click on one of those tasks in order to see what thread it's a part of and vice versa, which is pretty neat. So definitely check those two windows out if you find yourself having to debug multi-threaded or asynchronous applications a lot. Up next, we've got the exception settings window. This is kind of similar to the breakpoints window, uh, to the breakpoints window, except you can manage what exceptions you are notified about. So there may be some exceptions that maybe you don't care about, or maybe you want to specifically make sure are um, causing your program to break at. So you can go through a list of all the available exceptions, basically, <laughs> whether it's a whole group or category of extension of exceptions, or specific ones, and you can choose to disable or enable the notifications and the ability to break your code when they're thrown. Performance profiler. Honestly, this could have its own talk in general. <laughs> if you need a contact for that, Mark Downey might be down to give a talk on performance prof profiler because there is so much going on in this space alone. A uh, really powerful, great tool if you ever need to profile any um, of your applications once they're in production. It's got a lot of different features, including the expected CPU and memory usage tools, but it's also got other ones such as the, the database tool, which lets you see how much time specific queries are taking if you've got a program that uses databases. And uh, we've got the .NET async tool, which tells you uh, your, your async and await usage and how long things are taking there, as well as um, other different tools that you can take advantage of. So really cool thing that not a lot of people use, but if you've ever found yourself in a jam when it comes to improving your, uh, your performance of your application, then this is the place to be. We've also got the ability to debug external sources. So um, if you or somebody else makes a uh, like a NuGet package and gives the okay, that means that you as a consumer of that package can choose to debug that external source if you want. So um, in this example, we've got like the newtonsoft.json NuGet package. And if you suspect that something might be going on with that package and not necessarily your own code, you are allowed to attach to that and debug it as if it's your own code in, in a lot of ways. So um, you get full access to the source code and you can debug like you would your own code. And last but not least, the child process debugging extension. This is an extension that was created by the debugger team. And way back at the beginning of this talk, we talked about um, the ability to attach to process that might include child processes. So if you find yourself having to attach to child processes when it comes to debugging a lot, then you should definitely download this extension and share your feedback on that. This was actually created by um, the debugger team. So they're very familiar with what, with all the pitfalls that could come with child process debugging. And finally, before we get into Q&A, that concludes all of my content. Uh, first, I want to say a big thank you for uh, for watching and thanks for having me. I hope each of you again was able to take away a new tool that you can incorporate into your own development life. And if you want a refresher on any of the things that I talked about in this talk or any of the tools that I didn't talk about, believe it or not, there's <laughs> other tools in the debugging space out there that are just as cool that I just didn't talk about here. You can go to aka.ms slash VS debugging. This takes you to um, my GitHub repo that has the, uh, the demo code that I was using here, as well as a readme containing links to uh, a lot of different debugging features, both ones I talked about and ones that I didn't. And they all have links to corresponding blog posts or documentation. There's also links to recent debugging related videos, specifically when I highlight the ones that are about asynchronous debugging that either myself or members of the debugging team have given in the past. Uh, those are really great resources if that is something that you are very um, 
that you want to know more about. And also, uh, the debugger has a Twitter. So go to VS underscore debugger. There's usually just random fun facts about the debugger or some of its tools that happen on a semi-regular basis there. So you should definitely check that out. And I also have a Twitter, uh, at least for now. I, I might move to, t to threads eventually. I'm kind of dipping my toes right now, but I don't know. So um, yeah, but for now, I'm still available on Twitter. So feel free to reach out to me there if you have any other questions. And finally, please share your feedback on the developer community or DevCom for short. A lot of these tools did not happen um, without the feature request from people like you. So tools such as um, data breakpoints for C Sharp, it used to be a C++ exclusive. Other things like um, the table visualizer and um, dependent breakpoints, those didn't exist without feature requests. So the more the merrier, real human beings do look at those feature requests, <laughs> I promise. And they really help us figure out what we should be prioritizing feature-wise going forward. So yeah, that is my spiel. <laughs> Thank you. And I will open things up to questions. Awesome. Thank you. I really I greatly appreciate it. Uh, uh, so yeah, if there's any other questions, you're more than welcome to either put them in chat. You can come off mute if you would like and ask them that way. And one of the questions that I just recently came in is the, is the parallel stacks in community edition? Yes, it is. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Asynchronous uh, debugging is probably a skill in itself. And yeah. uh, so thankfully parallel tasks uh, window is there to, to help with that. So. All right. Uh, any other questions? we got a question. Yeah. How much of the stuff you showed us today can be used with Visual Studio 2019? Um, a good portion of it. I, I tried to point out the ones that were 2022 exclusive, like um, dependent breakpoints are 2022, temporary breakpoints are 2022, uh, or some other big ones. I mean, breakpoint groups are 2022, but the breakpoint window is not um, exclusive. What about the nest, the nested? uh debugging techniques where you could oh. drop drop into a specific uh statement yeah you can use that in 2019 that is a step into specific yeah i've never seen that before that's awesome yeah it's pretty cool it's um it's been in visual studio for a long time as far as i know so you're good there thanks mm -hmm. all right another question that came in uh no surprise on this one um uh what kind of improvements for debugging blazor wasm are coming up and cool. how will multi-threading at dot net 8 affect it oh my gosh that is a great question that i feel like i don't fully have the answer to i think dan roth would be the person to ask there uh i know there is work going into just improving that experience all up but i can't quite share specifics on what on what's going on but i i agree that it, that process could be improved greatly both when you're debugging and when you're not debugging i think the difficulty just comes from having multiple languages all within the same file and having visual studio swap between them and trying to identify which is which it makes it a little hard awesome yeah i did talk to uh uh roth and about uh possibly speaking to the group as well i just need to get him scheduled uh yeah. he said he would do it it kind of uh, as a verbal but kind of quick passing because he's also busy at their build but um yeah. i'll get him one of these days well yeah he, he'd be a great guy he's he's a cool dude yeah all right all right last chance for questions i see a lot of accolades coming in thank you uh great presentation um thank you great talk so a lot of great stuff greatly appreciate it awesome. all right i'll i'll go ahead and take back over and then i will stop the recording here in just a second